welcome to today's Art Tech conversation. This is a very sp special conversation for the Art Tech Foundation because it will allow us to reconnect with some past uh, nominees of the Art Tech Prize. This prize was created in 2017, and it is attributed by an international jury, jury during our annual Art Tech Forum. It rewards innovation in culture and creative industries in this ever-evolving landscape of art and technology. So we're very pleased to welcome two of our past nominees, Marie-Yves Didier of Matis and Sergio Ardelion, excuse me, <clears throat> of Art Vive. We are hoping maybe that other past nominees will join us during our webinar, but we're very pleased to welcome the two of you right now. So um, we are literally talking from all over the world because Marie, you are actually in Brazil right now. So let's start with you. You participated in the Artec Prize in 2021 with your startup Matis, which helps create, which helps, sorry, authenticate art. And Matis stands for Monitoring Art with Technology, Innovation and Science. It's a tool used um, to help and analyze and verify art. And in 2022, you won the BCN Innovation Prize. You're currently, like I said, in Brazil. So things are going well for Matis. Well, things are going well as a, as a, as in a startup, you know. So one day it's fine, the next day it's you don't know, but uh, we enjoy every every single single second of that. So you know, um, past thanks to this crisis and um, also some other. Uh, investment we got, we managed to uh, enlarge the team, brought to, um, you know, like a, we have the second version of the prototype, we have a few clients already, and now we are doing the internalization, uh, internationalization camp for um, also like uh, sealing and uh, doing client acquisition. So this is the moment now to do that since we are going to commercialize the project, the product and the software because we do hardware and software by the end of the year. Okay, so can you tell us a little bit more about Matisse, what it's all about, how you came about to create your startup? Yeah, so um, I'm uh, in the field of uh, art and technology since, uh, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago. So at that time, we were not talking about art tech. We were talking about archaeometry. So it was really an initiative from uh, anything related to academic archaeology, uh, how to use very important, like very specific imaging technology and image processing in order to help archaeologists for different things, for provenance, for um, re preservation and conservation. And uh, so that's how it, uh, you know, grew in my mind, being in the field of archaeometry with art historian, with restorers, with conservators, with museologue people, so that uh, I saw where the gap was. And uh, then with my studies in parallel in physics and my PhD in imaging and, um, and, and physics, I came up with the idea of fulfilling this gap with uh, the technological uh, side and inform information that I got from my knowledge. And uh, that's how all these things came together. So in the end, Matisse was the logic continuity of my, my path and the people I met also on this, on this path and the discussion that I had with the people in the art uh, business as well. Can you tell us a little bit more about your background and how you got interested in art? I mean, because you are a scientist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, still, I am a scientist. I always say, you know, I'm I'm a nerd. So I study quantum physics and particle <laughs> physics, but I also appreciate art because um, I think uh, every disciplines are are linked, and uh, that's how we we use. I mean, this diversity makes us like uh, sharp minds and, you know, intelligent in a way that uh, we can use different things that happen in different in different uh, realm and uh, make it um, even better. For so I've always been interested in art. Um, and that's a very funny story because uh, my mother, when I had to choose for university, she was like, how? So 
what can't you do as a hobby? I was like, yeah, I cannot do physics as a hobby. So I was like, yeah, here we go. Choose physics as a university and the rest as a hobby, but still nurture it. And uh, that's how um, uh, it came. I, I draw, I paint, I have a very classical background. So that's how, you know, I was interested in that. And um, can you tell us a little bit more about how important in today's world uh, art authentication is? Because we keep reading about these stories of, for example, recently there's a Botticelli that was found in Naples that resurfaced and nobody knows yeah. if it's a fake or if it's an authentic Botticelli. So how important is this problem in the art world today and what you're trying to help solve, basically? So authentication for us is one small branch of what we can give for art professional. Uh, this is something that, as you say, that is extremely well known. So we all, we've all heard about like problem of authenticity that affects reputation, financial, but also cultural and historical reputation. However, this is, that's the main, uh, let's say, mediatized um, problem in the art market. But there are so many other problems. How to conserve it, uh, how to preserve your collection. If you are a private collector here in Brazil, you have a lot of problems for the private collection because of the air, the humidity and stuff like that. So how not to damage your own collection, how to do preventive conservation, how to understand for art historian or conservator or where the, the the provenance and the and the materiality of your painting, for example. And this is all the question we address at Matisse. So basically we have a tool that is used as an immediate diagnosis tool, an imaging technology, like a small camera, extremely simple to use. And that give a first diagnosis on pigment identification, uh, underdrawing visualization, materiality, stretch of the canvas, stuff like that. And through uh, with our like software, because it's a it's a software we we give also to clients, we they can build their own platform in in a way that, for example, it's like uh, we all have a cell phone now. For example, you use it for like uh, taking picture. I use it to text to send make uh, text message. So you may use it for like uh, store documents, and that's basically what we have. We have a technology with a software, and then professional if it's for art experts for an authentication, for example, or restaurants, conservator, or museum, or institutions, or auction house. They will use it the way they want for their own needs. I see. Thank you. We're going to maybe talk a little bit with Sergio now to find out a little bit more about his startup, um, Artivive. So uh, we are going with you to sort of jump into the field of augmented uh, reality. You were a nominee for the prize in 2019. So will you tell us more about AR, because your field is basically AR, how AR is revolutionizing um, storytelling by layering digital enhancements over reality. That's something that you are going to have to explain to us so that we can all understand what that means exactly. This is a whole new world in art and brings with it tremendous innovation and creativity possibilities for artists. So what uh, value does AR bring specifically to arts and culture? Thank you, Miral. Yes, uh, and thank you very much for having me today. Um, I also prepared the presentation because I think it's um, easier to show. It sounds very complicated, but at the end, it's something that's extremely easy also to create and consume. Um, so I'll just share my screen. I hope that you can see it. Perfect. Um, and I will bring you to a museum um, and show you a use case that we used here in Vienna, but not only, also with institutions that uh, we work with all around the world. And if we're looking at the collections that many museums have, um, they have a tremendous story behind it. And the way how we can, you know, go into these stories is mostly through audio guides, um, or if we're lucky, we have a live guide um, who's uh, bringing us to the museum. But at the same time, it's very hard, um, you know, to process all the information that these artworks have. Um, and I choose one of Schiller's artwork, which is depicting um, Edith, his wife. And this painting has a very interesting story because in the first version um, of the painting, um, she looked more like this. 
And the reason why was that she was stressed out of this. Um, back in the days, Sheila and his family didn't really have a lot of money. Um, so, you know, they just came by and um, tried to sell the artworks in order to survive. And when he presented this version to the director of the gallery at that time, he said that unfortunately she's dressed too poorly and doesn't match a fine arts museum. It's more like an applied arts, uh, arts artwork. So what he did was went back to his studio and overpainted the painting in the version that we have today, which is an amazing, amazing. story, right? Yeah. Because um, it tells so much about the time. It tells so much about the artist and the artwork as well as the museum. So at that time when Chile was alive, um, it was still a gallery or, um, you know, the artwork was bought directly from the artist. And what we did here was to take this story and um, put it in augmented reality where we were also able to highlight the differences um, in the painting, what he decided to change. And we managed to tell the whole story in 30 seconds. Um, instead, like two minutes um, as the or three minutes the audio guide had it. And it was also much easier for the visitor to have an image. And the most interesting part is if you're looking here at the skirt, it has a lot of orange. And in the final version, you'll find bits of the orange color sh uh, shining through the, the paint. And what we had was people putting the phone away, going a little bit closer to the paintings and seeing uh, and recognizing this color and we because we were also looking at how people are using the technology and we heard them it's like oh look it's true here is the orange and this is the experience right this is the experience that we're taking with them um this is an example that is going more into the art history and how you can build stories with the technology where the technology goes into um you know the the second layer or into the back because it's always about the content but when we opened um, our platform a few years ago for artists, we saw amazing ways how they are building a new narrative. For example, this is a poster that um, was for the animation festival in Berlin. And they really used it like a window into the content that they're offering at the uh, festival. But it's not only this, everything that is in the creative space, if it's from fashion or a tattoo or a pin um, or a t-shirt or stickers, everything can be um, extended with a digital story. And we see that this is somehow how many uh, creatives um, are working and learning how to build their own narrative where they also have sound or they have voices or effects um, and animations that they can add to their works. Um, so we see augmented reality as a new art form, maybe the art form of our century, where we are combining the traditional, the haptic, the parts that are reality with the power of digital. And I would like just to share um, one or two more examples of how these narratives can be built. On the left side, we have um, a poster that has a lot of elements and it's very hard you know, to recognize all of them. So you have to look very closely and put a lot of effort to see it. But the moment that you have the animation coming in, um, our lizard brain is just looking at the elements that are moving and we're just seeing that. And it's much easier than to recognize what the composition of the artwork is. On the right side, it's something that it's very hard to recognize, but the moment that um, we get a different perspective, I like to say that the artist in this case is rewiring the brain and then showing what's behind it. And then when you're looking back to the poster, you see what it really is, what it was meant. It. So it's like a hand from a very different uh, perspective with a very weird texture. And what we managed to do with Artivive, and we have um, almost a half a million of creatives on our platform using this technology is that we stripped it of all what's code and technology. It's extremely easy. You can use it on an iPad, on a phone to create your augmented reality experiences. You just have to upload something which is in reality, which can be from a tattoo to a street art to a painting. And then you can extend it with the digital content from 3D objects to just an animation or audio or particle systems. Um, yes, so um, this is a very short summary of what we managed to do in the last six years. Um, also for the ones that are interested to try it out, um, please uh, feel free to register and also use the code um, Artivive Art Tech uh, to get a discount if you want to subscribe and use the tool. 
Thank you, Sergey. I'm going to just, I'm going to ask you a question, but I first want to welcome our two other panelists who have arrived and who are joining us. So it's Edgar Hemery, and we also have Robert Norton with us, and we'll hear from them in a little bit. So, but Sergio, first, I just want to ask you one follow-up question. Um, what role do you think that um, technology would play in art and uh, creativity? What role would AR technology play, you think? Um, that's a very good question. Um, as you know, as how we are looking at technology, it's in a, tot a totally different way um, compared to 100 years ago. Back then, you know, photography and film was the technology. Um, we call it today analog, um, but it was the technology of the day. And this is what's happening with the technologies that we're developing now. They are just technologies and the new things right now, but they will be adapted by the new creatives where we can also see how the new, um, new storytellings and narratives um, are made. And I think um, it's very important not to concentrate on the technology, like the example with the museum, but more on the content. When people are not talking about the technology anymore and how awesome it is, but more on the content, I think we already managed to get a step further with it. Okay, thank you. So we will have more questions for you after we hear from all of the uh, members of our panel today. So let's talk now maybe with Edgar Henry after visual arts. We'll now uh, talk about sound and music with you. Um, you were a nominee for the Art Tech Prize in 2020, and your startup develops 3D touch and uh, vision sensors for the future of human computer interaction. You also uh, create uh, expressive music interface and they're used like artists, by artists, excuse me, like uh, Jean-Michel Jarre, who I believe is on your board. And you recently released ERA2. So tell us um, about how your startup has evolved since uh, 2020. Hello, Muriel. Um, thanks for the intro and thanks for having me. So yeah, uh, I will also share um, a few slides. Um, can you can you see? Perfectly. Yeah, marvelous. So, Embod Me started out of uh, five years research in robotics uh, that I carried during my PhD between 2013 and uh, 2018, and this is when uh, I started to work on different things. But uh, one of the big topic was gesture capture for music. So the ability to um, track um, the gesture of a musician, say a pianist, uh, using computer vision and AI and use this data to then um, ex extract information about style, for example, uh, or a being able to synthesize uh, electronic sounds with uh, more control over um, the, the sound parameters. Uh, because. Uh, if you look at what's uh, available in terms of music device since um, many years, they haven't really evolved uh, since, you know, like the 80s or 90s. Uh, you know, like the gear and electronic music is still very much buttons and, and, and keyboards, which limit uh, expressivity in, in terms of uh, you know, like the uh, richness of gesture that you, you can track on a real instrument. So this is really one of the, the starting point of uh, our uh, work at Embodme. And so the first product we released in 2020 called ERA Touch is an expressive music controller. So a music controller is, or MIDI controller is a device that you use to control uh, sounds on a computer or uh, hardware synthesizers. Um, and the, uh, the uh, the ability of the array touch to detect what we call 3D touch makes it more um, expressive. So we can play vibratos, we can use the aftertouch, you can strum, you can uh, do a lot of variation of gestures on the device. And because it's basically a, a matrix of LEDs, which on top we have, you know, like a kind of semi rigid silicon uh, surface. Uh, because it's um, a matrix of LEDs, we are able to display uh, things like keyboards or mixers or anything that a musician would need uh, in a studio. So this uh, device 
uh, is very useful both in live and in the studio and it brings expressivity to digital music. Um, so we discontinued this product uh, at the end of 2023. And as you, you've mentioned, uh, we unveiled recently uh, the uh, new version of it, which is called ERA2, which benefits from lots of work we've carried uh, over the past three years uh, and benefited from the development of ERA Touch and lots of feedback that we, we got from our uh, customers. And so we just uh, started the pre-sales uh, in March for one month. And now we are in, we're like in production, uh, hoping to, to ship the first units in September. So I'll just give you a quick demo so you bet can picture how it looks like. So uh, as you see, it's, um, it's been used in this example as a looper because it loops the sound, but also as a drum pad because you can hit it with drumsticks. And then as a very like, you know, kind of lyrical instrument where you do pitch bands, glissandos and, and things like that. So it's a very versatile and expressive uh, music controller and looper. Um, so yeah, the technology that we've developed for ERA2, uh, oh, sorry, yeah. This is just like roadmap for future products. But uh, so yeah, the technology that we've developed with ERA2 and the ERA Touch uh, goes a bit further than just the musical uh, vertical, which is, you know, not that scalable. I mean, it is of course, but it's not something that will, you know, like change the world. But um, in parallel to what we've been uh, looking at with the uh, music dev development, is the um, special interaction because one of the technology that we've developed uh, is the ability to track gestures uh, on the surface and up to a few centimeters above. And when you look at the recent developments in special interaction, it seems that you know the ability to hover elements or to manipulate three D objects is slowly but surely uh, becoming more and more mainstream. So this is an an idea of you know what we could bring on a consumer product um, device. So the same ideas mm -hmm. that we had for music, but applied to say an iPad where you can hover. Uh, hover means that you can also um, touch without touching, which is touchless interaction. And so we've been working a lot on the development of, the, of a, a brand new sensor for this type of interaction. Uh, which is called IRIS and which enables what we call 3D near field. So we have filed five patents over the past uh, five years now on, on this topic, which is very like deep tech, you know, uh, work and which has lots of potential outcomes, but which is really hard to, to produce and, uh, and the time and the money that we need to, to make it perfect actually takes a while. So this is why we have to sell, you know, products on the side. Uh, we cannot just do research, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, we've already um, unveiled this uh, product at CES last year, which is the first touchless screen with a very retail oriented experience where you can hover objects and manipulate. Um, change some parameters so you could picture this screen behind a window shop for example so that you can just interact from the outside um, and yeah be able to teach you again manipulate with 3d objects on a screen as opposed to you know uh, having a headset on your face um, this same technology is currently under discussion with other uh, applications so we are discussing about in-flight entertainment um, 
though is a um, digital out of home. So all the kiosks that you would have in shopping malls or museums or hospital, uh, this uh, type of touch screens that you would rather not touch if you had the choice. Um, and also uh, the automotive industry. <clears throat> Um, so yeah, we're addressing this uh, interactive kiosk market, and this is, I think, one of the next milestones for us, um, is to start selling the first units. Uh, at, this, at this moment, we are really at the showcase phase, where we can just only show the, the product in some trade shows and, and perhaps like sell a few units, but uh, really a lot of work ahead to, to be able to distribute and even to, to license, which would be, of course, like the, the best option for us um, to not have to produce thousands of units, but rather um, sell uh, either chip or license the, the algorithms. Uh, we have a few side projects also uh, with the industry, same technology that we've developed for music, but applied for very specific uh, industrial use cases, and it's a great way for us to, you know, complement our revenues. Um, and yeah, I think I will stop here. Uh, the team is uh, still rather small. We're uh, eight full-time people and, and a few uh, other interns in the team. So yeah. It's very exciting. I think it looks uh, very exciting. When I hear you, I have one question: Is sure. what are the, you talked about your client base? That mostly professionals. You're talking about the auto industry, hospitals, etc. But is it also for like professional musicians or even people like me who just want to play around and maybe create something? So it's a question. Um, it's a good question that uh, we often have, and um, I personally don't see a limit between you know professional and someone who aspires at um, getting uh, better at, you know, creating music with digital tools. Um, the only thing is uh, the product is, you know, on the high end kind of sort of yeah. price range. <clears throat> uh, so typically people who would start usually um, look at solutions that are underneath 500 euros or dollars. Um, and I think, yeah, in the future, we, in our roadmap, we, we plan on having like a more affordable unit for uh, beginners. But at the moment, we were like, I think on the ERA2 touch, we were just trying to make a product. With the ERA2, uh, we are solving many issues. And I think we're trying to, to build up a, a reputation for having like the best expressive uh, controller in the market. And I think next would be uh, to yeah start to talk to more people. Thank you. And so we're going to hear from the last uh, member of our panel today, which is um, who is uh, Robert Norton, or your next speaker. And so your startup Verizart was a nominee for the Artec Prize in 2018. It's an online service which allows artists to certify digital or physical creation, including NFTs using blockchain technology to protect records of creation and ownership. So you're going to tell us a little bit more about the boom and bust cycles of NFTs, which are kind of complicated to understand, and where we are today with real blockchain applications in the art market. And you have some exciting news because uh, you just launched at the Venice Biennale your new print your own NFT service. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, and uh, sure, let me uh, let me get right into it. Um, it's great to hear the other presentations as well. Um, amazing startups. I'm glad to be part of it. Yeah, so I guess um, we we start. I think we were nominated in 2018, but we started the business in 2015. So next year will be our tenth year, um, and uh, it's 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 an exciting journey, but a bit of a slow haul as well. Um, I think, you know, navigating a startup in a kind of you know boom and bust cycle like we've seen in NFTs is kind of challenging. But we've now got over 175,000 works on chain and 55,000 creators uh, on our platform. Uh, where we were in 2018 was really kind of like talking about this idea of art and blockchain for the first time and saying, look, we think that there are better ways 
to do certificates of authenticity than pieces of paper, because pieces of paper can't, of course, be verified real time at arm's length. So not very helpful in terms of digital transactions or online transactions. And also they take a long time and often, um, you know, they're kind of an unloved part of the art world. And we thought it'd be much better to empower artists with um, better certification standards. And really we've been standing by that um, point of view uh, along our journey. Um, in the early years, um, you know, we partnered with some well-known um, art platforms. Uh, we received lots of press um, and we've raised money uh, multiple times. Um, and we've proven that we can partner with some of the best companies out there from eBay to Shopify and Artsy and Super Rare. Um, we also, in the uh, boom times of 2021, got quite involved with the NFT landscape. Um, we did a number of drops with well-known artists from Neil Belufa, Petra Courtright, Shepard Ferry, Universal Everything. Uh, we did the first kind of representations of estates in the NFT space with Lee Mullican. Uh, we um, also did kind of more inaugural um, artist NFTs than probably any other platform, at least those artists coming from the traditional and contemporary art world. Um, and where we kind of started to, to, to leave things was thinking about these communities of NFT holders um, and how we could sort of build better digital experiences. Um, and so every NFT that's minted with Verisart all came with the Verisart certificate. So in the metadata, you saw it was Verisart certified and it was linking back to an enhanced um, um, record of the work. Um, yep, as you kind of talked about at the beginning, you know, we saw a kind of massive peak and then a massive drop. Um, in the last um, six months, it's actually been looking kind of more positive and we're starting to see increase again, uh, albeit in a different way. Um, so despite this kind of boom and bust cycle, you know, we never stopped um, growing our service and thinking about better ways that we can empower creators on their journey. And what's been so exciting um, in this uh, last few years is just seeing the new number of creators that are entering the space uh, and all the kind of fresh ideas that are coming in. And that's what makes the art market exciting. You know, we saw it kind of grow with the street art community and we saw it grow also with the um, digital art community and particularly the, um, NF the those artists that were exploring uh, NFTs. Um, we also kind of got our first patent in July 2021. We got our second one uh, last year uh, and we're filing a third patent at the moment. And really at the heart of the patent was, again, kind of like learnings that we picked up along the way. But this idea that just because something's on the blockchain doesn't, of course, mean it's true. Uh, it means the transaction is true, but what it points to may be, may be false, right? The, the IP, the creative that it is representing, that the transaction is representing, the creative that the deed of ownership is representing, you know, may be true or false. Um, and, and we saw that kind of a number of times with, you know, people buying NFTs uh, from, you know, fake accounts or NFTs of people um, who didn't own the IP, the intellectual property rights in those NFTs. So we kind of pioneered this idea of a ladder of confidence that the NFTs can, uh, or the, the the blockchain records can change state depending upon um, the authorization of the artist and what is known about the work. Um, and so we have this kind of ladder of confidence where you can build a, uh, you can start creating an unverified record if that record is then um, uh, authorized by the creator. That same metadata, that same record automatically becomes a certificate of authenticity. And if you add an NFC tag or a QR tag to your physical item or some other, you know, multi-spectral imaging report or some other way that you can verify the physical work, then you can upgrade that to a certificate of authenticity. And we're still we're still working on that, but it's become a lot clearer from where we were back in 2018. Um, our course certification business is growing. Um, haven't got sort of data for this year um, because this is the last thing I pulled quickly for the presentation. But you know we're now at over 175,000 uh, certificates, and I think we'll be uh, about a quarter of a million by the end of the year. Um, we also kind of found new ways that we could get our service closer to the time of the transaction. And so we integrated with Shopify. We were the first blockchain certification app on Shopify. We're now the leading Web3 app on Shopify. We do blockchain certification, we do NFT minting, and we also do token gating. And these were sort of foundational pieces that enabled us to launch our new token gated print service, which I'm going to come on to now. Um, yeah, so the 
The Web3 app on Shopify, a bit like you know many entrepreneurs with their startups, we built it, we rebuilt it, we rebuilt it again, um, and kind of think we just got better uh, each time. Um, and we now, as a, as a result of that, also have an app on WooCommerce as well. And that's our aim to really integrate at the e-commerce level so that when people buy uh, a, a work by a creator, they can actually get a digital certificate at the time that they purchase the work. And we believe that will make their work um, more valuable in the long term, or certainly retain, help, help prevent um, um, uh, fake works entering that artist's or creator's market. Um, and we're seeing sort of merchants experimenting with the digital as a result of you know, the apps that are on Shopify and WooCommerce. So, you know, we started very much in the art world, but now, you know, the many much, much more sort of just makers um, and, and a broader sort of sense of creators. Um, we also started ironically having built a digital certification platform offering uh, printed products um, because despite, you know, the uh, rush to the digital, people still want physical in their lives. And, and that's actually kind of, again, why our print service has just kind of come about. Um, and so, you know, finding ways to securely link uh, the physical and the digital has been something that we've really been honing in on. Um, token gated commerce is, I think, a really exciting new area. Um, and it's the one I'm just going to spend the last minute or so talking about, um, which is this new print service. Um, because the problem with NFTs is that, you know, if they're, this was the, if they're hidden, um, they're not seen and artists want their works kind of seen. So, uh, we know a lot about um, um, prints um, through the artists that we work with. And we basically built a service where um, the artists can simply download our Shopify app and sign up um, to um, have a print uh, of their NFTs um, and simply determine the rule of the token gate, which means how many, um, who, who can buy the work, you know, what the price is. Um, and what's really cool is that the actual um, uh, product listing page on the merchant store automatically gets updated with the token ID that the person is using to go through the the gate. Um, so it's really it's really cool because you see the product being listed, and then once you've gone through the token gate, your image of your token is actually put back onto the product listing page, and you can actually see that through the checkout flow <clears throat> through your um, order, and it's uh, you know your own personal print of an NFT that you own. Um, we do all the invoicing and reporting through Shopify, so it's a very uh, easy way for merchants or creators to get involved. And yeah, we did our first uh, launch of this just a few weeks ago with Bright Moments at the Venice Biennale, and we have um, two more uh, well-known kind of artists and platforms uh, using the service in the next month. And we see this is really kind of pulling together a lot of the different areas that Verisart's been building over the last uh, almost 10 years. Thank you. Well, that's really congratulations for this uh, great evolution. I, there is one question that comes to my mind listening to you is the problem of trust basically between because NFTs sort of have, you know, in the general public, I think a, I want to say bad reputation just because most people don't really understand what they are or are afraid of them or if some like you were talking about how it's digital you can't touch it you can't feel it so how how much of a problem is that for you because it it's really a question of trust with with your customers with the public yeah i think it's um you know when new technology comes out um it's often given names that perhaps you know don't last the test of time and i'm not sure that the you know, NFTs have been sort of seen as somewhat toxic. And, you know, even the term Web3 has its kind of bad connotations. But the reality is that um, there's, you know, uh, increasing numbers of people that are kind of finding one way or another to use these te technologies. And so, you know, we're seeing, um, you know, brands like um, well-known shop, um, well-known well retail brands in the U.S., that are launching things with NFT infrastructure, but they're not using the word NFT. You know, they're using the word <laughs> digital souvenir or collectible or any of these things. And, and so that's kind of like one thing just to kind of like note, which is that you know, the technology is still being used. It's just perhaps not being called the thing that is going to most kind of break people's sort of trust. And people the, off. Yeah. yeah. And the second, the second thing though, is that you know, this community is real. And, you know, it, when you step inside it, if you go to 
you know, an art blocks kind of community gathering in Martha, Texas, or you, uh, you know, go to some of these kind of like uh, um, conferences where, you know, generative artists, you know, generative art has been one of the really big um, bright spots in this area, you know, despite the bear market last year, generative art surpassed all time highs in terms of auction prices. Um, and you're seeing it seeping into, you know, museum collections, you're seeing it seeping into art fairs. And when you immerse yourself amongst this kind of like new community of generative artists who make their living from selling NFTs, and again, they're also distancing themselves with that term, there's a real energy there. And I think that that sort of visual vocabulary will, um, uh, is here to stay. And I think it will sort of translate into a next wave of generative goods where these actual kind of like styles of art start to appear uh, in, in in more kind of pedestrian things like your scarf or your your cup or your t-shirt or your um, vase. And, and, and that's kind of, I think, very exciting. So uh, we have time now for some questions. I don't know if there's any questions from the people who are watching us, but... I will ask a few and then hopefully some questions will come from other people. So the, the idea of this conversation today was to talk about the Artec Prize and, you know, how important it is. And when we listen to all of you, we can see how um, the jury really picked the right horses, if I can say that, of people who participated, because it's all very exciting, I think, what you're doing. So, Marie, we heard from you first, so let me ask you maybe the, the first question. There were a lot of conditions uh, to participate in this competition, so what made you decide at the time to go for it and to apply for the competition, for the prize? Well, there are not a lot of um, organisms doing something with art tech, so that's why it was one of the of the um, main decision, you know. And it's uh, it's good to contact uh, and to connect with the community as well in the art and technology field. Mm -hmm. And what did it what did it bring you? What how important was it for you to participate in terms of contacts or in terms of actually meeting other people doing startups etc how important was it for you okay um well you know important enough i would say just uh, connecting mm -hmm. with other fellows um i don't know i'm i'm, I'm not that uh, involved into that so that's why maybe i'm not the right person to answer <laughs> Um, okay. But, um, yes, but but you know we see familiar faces, and that's one thing that is interesting. Like we started there, and then we see how things evolve, and that's uh, the added value of that. You know, like uh, connecting, having the network. As I say, like it's very important to have this network, and um, and to be part of that. So you know, for example, I mean we we met many times also with uh, Robert <laughs> in Dubai, and uh, now here. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's good to have a community like that. It's it's very important. Yeah. And for you, um, Sergei, how, how important was it to participate in this prize, and what did it bring you? Um, exactly like Marie said, um, you know, in 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 the startup world, um, there are not many that are understanding um, the value that um, you know arts and culture are providing. Uh, because unfortunately, um, it's something, an investment um, that takes a little bit longer. Um, I feel that, you know, all the work that we're doing and all with the startups that you um, have here and um, also the startups that were through the program um, through the last years, we're doing something that is changing and helping the society. So that's for, mm -hmm. it's something that takes a little bit of longer time that maybe some VCs and investors would love to. Uh, but at the same time, it's also something sustainable because in the moment that we manage to, you know, add value in arts and culture, it's something that will stay there for many years. And um, like Marie said, a few years ago, there were none, <laughs> um, none other um, initiatives in this this direction besides Artec, and it was so important, you know, to see that we are not alone, um, and there is a community, and we have the same struggles which kept us on road and gave us the energy that there is something possible. And now we see that there's more and more coming, um, like also the Caltech Accelerator. Also Caltech is now um, a general of startups and we see more and more creatives 
building startups, which shows that um, Artec, you know, that the work that was done there and helping the startups that are today here and also out there um, helped us to develop a totally new way of building ventures. And Edgar, what about you? I'd like to get your thoughts on that. How, how, because uh, I remember when you gave your demonstration, I think a lot of people were very impressed in the public. Everybody, you know, it's always very impressive when you are part of the public and we listen to all of you giving your pitches and we're thinking, wow, this is so brilliant. What great ideas and things. So what did it bring you, this Art Tech Prize? So, um, yeah, all the things that have been said, um, I think it's a, a community that stays for many years. Uh, we're not many, um, so, you know, we connect stronger and I'm sure it will last uh, quite, quite a long time. Um, and then, yeah, it's this community that, you know, um, how to say, uh, through our, our tech, for example, we met uh, the people at Caltech and we managed to, to raise money at some point and uh, we keep a strong relationship with uh, these communities and, and it will help eventually for business and you never know when, but yeah, it's, uh, it's really mm -hmm. helpful. And um, Robert, I, um... The world has really changed since uh, you participated in the Art Tech Prize. The tech, tech landscape is constantly changing and evolving. So can you tell us how um, what changes you've seen and how you adapt to these changes? Um, I, I, well, I mean, I think people didn't really put art and technology sort of in the same sentence that much when the prize we started, I think it was quite forward thinking uh, back in 2017. Um, and they were probably quite difficult to find um, companies that really actually, you know, met the requirements of being art and tech back then. Um, but I think, you know, a lot has changed uh, in terms of, you know, the improvements in terms of, um, you know, broadband internet, um, the ability for, you know, the sort of like mobile app infrastructure to sort of like create richer experiences. Um, and then obviously we've seen like, you know, big waves of blockchain and big waves of AI right now. Um, and we're going to start to see how it starts to shake out um, because, you know, often like sort of technologies are overhyped in the short term and underestimated in the long term. But I think what Art Tech has done is it's created a good forum for, you know, people who identify themselves uh, in the art tech space that are really trying to build, um, you know, serious products that um, add value to the world. And I think that when you have hype cycles, you often end up with like lots of people sort of just wanting to ride the hype bubble. Um, and I can tell you that, you know, I think the fact that it's part of a foundation um, is also interesting because I don't know many other prizes that have kind of come back and wanted to sort of check in on former nominees and prize winners kind of years later. And I think that is um, is great and, and, and the reason why I wanted to take part in, in it. Yeah, well, we're all curious to know what has happened to, you know, so we're very pleased that you're participating in this round table. So um, Marie, to, I'm going to ask you the same question. Um, how, you know, the world has evolved, things have changed. What are, what are the biggest challenges for you to adapt to all this, all these changes for your startup? Um, we have a very conservative approach uh, coming from materiality and academia. So that's why for us, it's, uh, it's very smooth. So we don't really face many challenges uh, for that. The, the people we talk with, they understand exactly what is in their needs. And for us, we coming from this field, uh, it's just a logic continuity. So maybe the challenge is not to impose a technology that is coming from a different field, but understanding the real needs of the market, of the materiality of the professionals in this field, so that we as technologists, we adapt to them and not we, uh, we are not replacing, we are empowering. And that's very, very... Um, important um, uh, way to to tackle the the ecosystem right now 
And Sergio, what about you? Um, the, what about the competition? Has it kind of changed the way you uh, you work or you evolve in your startup? Um, I think we, from, from, from the first day, we had a very close relationship with our users, with the creatives. And we wanted to build something for the artists and we wanted to understand what they really need. Um, and this paid off at the end um, because we really build a product that they love to use. Um, and if we're looking who's else in, in this you know, augmented reality, spatial computing space, um, if it's Meta with the Spark AR or if it's um, Snap with Lens, uh, we see that many artists um, are also coming from their side, first of all, because it's a more technical product, but the second also the way how they monetize the content, right? So in, in our case, um, we have a subscription-based model where the creatives are paying for the tool um, and we are uh, very sensible about the data and the artworks that they're uploading, which is different with the, with the other bigger players. Um, and that somehow helps us to have as many creatives on our platform as Snap has, um, actually more than Snap, as many as Meta have, um, and we also see that we have also a lot of traditional artists that want to explore the digital space. Um, so I think, um, you know, back to your question, um, what was um, from the beginning us, uh, helping us to, to grow and build the product is to be very close and listen to the community. Um, Robert, uh, um, what about COVID? I mean, that's one of the things that we, you know, we, the world has really changed, not just in terms of technology, just not in terms of, uh, of you know, the evolution of everything that we've seen around us. We had COVID also that came along. How has that affected uh, your startup and the way of doing business? Um, I mean, it's harder to get our employees to come back to the office, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> we had a sort of five-day-a-week uh, policy, and now... Um, three day a week is about as much as we can kind of get sometimes we get four days a week if we're lucky uh, I'm in five days a week but you know I haven't managed to kind of convince my team that that's what they should do too but then I've had three young children since the time that we did the uh, art blocks prize so we have a five three and a uh, two-year-old at home so um, um, uh, in terms of COVID I think the main that you know, I think we've been lucky, right? <clears throat> in the sense that we didn't really have to have physical touch points before our business. Um, so the main impact that it's had uh, has really been about how we work. Um, and so um, I think you know we were very impressed by the way that the team you know really managed to work in a way that was kind of almost unrecognizable from how they'd be working normally if they were in meetings together in the real you know in, in the real world. Uh, or in physical real in the same physical space. And so um that's kind of obviously meant that it's harder to make an argument why they should come back to work when they've proven that they can work effectively remotely. Um, but yeah, I think sort of like many other businesses, you know, we, we uh, I mean from fr from an art world perspective, I think what was interesting about COVID um is that it really um brought to mainstream awareness QR codes. You know that suddenly like qr codes were just something that you know everybody accepted and they kind of used and and, and that meant that you know people are much used to um sort of this blend between something that's and i guess maybe an artive you know that might be similar the, the augmented side and and the real side that people are more sort of willing to kind of context switch from a sort of physical environment into a digital you know uh, approval status um, and I think that's helpful for thinking about digital experiences or augmented experiences moving forward so I think that that's actually been one of the sort of positive things that you could say has come out of it. Hmm. And Gal, what about you how did uh, COVID affect you or did it affect you did it help you or hurt you in your startup? Um, actually the um... The problem with COVID was uh, there was also a big shortage of components. So we had to delay the year when we actually unveiled the first product. We had to um, delay by almost a year for uh, our first backers, first customers. So it was kind of complicated to release the first product in those conditions. But uh, very luckily, 
uh, we turned this into our advantage uh, because we had more time to get feedback. We actually improved the product a lot. And now um, a few years back, I realized that if we did ship with the um, original schedule, uh, probably we would have uh, very um, disappointed customers. So in a way, it was it was good to have this uh, time to to improve a product and also to start focusing more on some um, algorithms and other applications of. Uh, uh, so it literally changed in me as a, as a company. I think we were we could have been much more, you know, like music, digital music. Uh, instrument um, companies and and now we have you know a, a larger vision so but yeah same mm -hmm. problem uh, as uh, Robert it's it's sometimes hard to get your employees to stay uh, five days a, a week in the office and to be honest remote work doesn't really work so well uh, with everyone so yeah mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, we have a, uh, about uh, four minutes left for our conversation. I'm going to ask you all to conclude with this one question that I wanted to ask all of you and um, is what can we wish for you for the next few years? What are your ambitions for your startup and what can we really hope will happen for you if you had a magical wand? So, Marie, let's start with you. What what can we hope for you in the next few years? Okay, so simplification of uh, administration uh, procedure for this is endless, tired, you know, it's... Yeah, so if uh, there is another startup listening to us to faster um, administrative procedure, yeah, please, I will... <laughs> I will go for that. Um, no, I mean, we are like in the process of uh, fundraising and I can tell you like fundraising in Switzerland, good luck, you know. So, I mean, it's not a problem of finding uh, investors. It's just a problem of administrative uh, work. But anyway, so no, just uh, uh, I, uh, for the next five years, continuing our passion, that would be the best, you know. Okay. Well, we hope that for you as well. As Sergio, for you, what is um, what is your ambition for the next few years? Um, I think we are already on on the way there to establish augmented reality as an art form. You know how photography and film develops to be an art form, um, and people will you know see it as an extension of traditional art with a digital storytelling or you know an nft that you can wear or have as a tattoo so that um you know people start realizing that art will move into both direction at the same time and somehow unified okay nft tattoo that's a new one i haven't <laughs> heard that one yet. <laughs> and yeah what about you what are your ambitions for the next few years uh, so yeah, of course to start uh, to continue growing the the brand and the music line of products. But I think the, the dream for us would be really to uh, have um, spread this touchless technology in in different application and maybe one day uh, manage to integrate it in consumer electronics. So that would be yeah, the, the ultimate uh, dream. Okay, and and Robert, what about you? Well, we just hope that you know the creators will continue um, to create great works, um, and that those works will be able to tell a story um, that isn't confined just to their uh, physical natures, um, and that you know we really believe that the importance of storytelling is through certification and as well as the authentication of the work, and so we hope to be a standard by which physical works can tell their story. I really, really want to thank you all because we're coming to the end of this Art Tech conversation. It was wonderful to um, hear from you, to know where you are at, and um, it was a great discussion. Thank you very much. I also want to thank the organizer of this event, the heart and soul of the Art Tech Foundation, and Nathalie Pichard. And if you miss some of our conversation or if you want to see it again or hear it again, you will be able to do so starting tomorrow on the Artec uh, YouTube channel. And so we hope to hear and see all of you 
in June for the next Art Tech Conversation. Thanks again to all the participants. See you soon. Thank you, Muriel. Thank you, Art Tech. Thank you.